Great that you were able to join us uh, on this wonderful uh, day to discuss a question of leadership. And we have some dynamic speakers on our list today. Um, I'm going to try to introduce uh, the three the three speakers, and and then we're going to try to go into a, a informal conversation with them. Uh, this is not going to be. Um, a question, a questioning of the individuals in the way that you normally find on panels. But I, I, I believe that we're gonna have an informal conversation among us uh, today. And I hope you enjoy what we have to offer. Uh, the first person I'm gonna introduce is Al Alisa Trotz. Uh, she is professor of Caribbean studies at the, at the New College uh, and director of women and, graduate, and gender studies at the University of Toronto in Canada. She is also an affiliate faculty at the Dame Nita Barrow Institute uh, of for Gender and Development Studies at the University of the West Indies. And that's on Cape Hill campus in Barbados. She's editor of the anthology that we're gonna be discussing today. Uh, the point is to change the world. Selected writings by Andaya. And this is published by Pluto Press uh, in 2020. And she's also co-author with Arif Balkan uh, of a book titled Unmasking the State, uh, Politics, Economy and Society, 1992 to 2015. And that's published by Ian Randall Press in 2019. For the past 12 years, uh, Alisa has been editing a weekly newspaper column in the diaspora in Starbrook News in Guyana. So that's uh, the first person I want to introduce. And the second person is Godfrey Smith, who is the award-winning author of the biography of George Price, the highly acclaimed biography of Michael Manley. And recently he has published uh, a new book uh, that deals with the assassination of Maurice Bishop uh, from Grenada. He's a former foreign minister and attorney general of Belize and a former judge of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. Um, the third person is a person that you probably all know by reputation, uh, Percival J. Patterson. And of course, he's widely and fondly known to many of us as PJ. Um, he's a former prime minister of Jamaica, as you know, and is the longest serving prime minister in history uh, in Jamaica from 1992 to 2006. I, although he's remained active in public life at the national level, at the regional level and the international level, he still found time to, uh, to pen his autobiography, My Political Journey. That's the book that we're gonna be discussing today, uh, Jamaica's sixth prime minister. And that's published by University of West Indies Press in 2018. The book recently won the prestigious 2020 Next Generation Indie Book Award for memoir. And he has dedicated uh, the, the book to his mother um, and to Norman Washington Manley, uh, who he calls my low star. And uh, so those are the three guests that we have. One of the things about leadership and political leadership is that we tend sometimes to focus on elected leadership, people who are elected to office. Um, and I think we want to sort of broaden out this concept of leadership by talking about leaders who are not just elected, 
but leaders who are from the grassroots, leaders who spring from the grassroots, emerge from the grassroots. And I think Alisa is going to be uh, able to give us some more information about that. But we want to start with uh, PJ Patterson. I'm going to go in reverse order from how I introduced the three speakers. And we wonder whether or not um, the three speakers can actually read a section from the books uh, on the review today. Uh, starting with PJ Patterson, with your autobiography, if you can spend about five or 10 minutes uh, reading a passage from your book, and then we'll move uh, on to Godfrey, and then on to Elisa. And then we get into a sort of a much broader conversation about, about th uh, three different things I'd like to, to raise uh, with the audience. Um, the sort of the, the, the epistemological reasons why people write books like this, um, political leadership books, um, the, the ontological reasons, uh, the context, the historical context uh, within which these books emerge, and then some personal anecdotes about uh, why the, the, you, know, you spend time working on books of this sort. So why don't we start with PJ Patterson, former prime minister of Jamaica. Sure, uh, Professor Knight and colleagues, it's a pleasure for me to participate in this festival. In discussing the question of leadership, I would like to begin by speaking about the most of influential leadership and provision of knowledge which shaped my launched into leadership and finally resulted in my election as prime minister and as chairman of the Caribbean community for a number of occasions. I think I was affected by a political virus at birth uh, because in 1944, when we gained universal adult suffrage, I had a headmaster in the primary school of St. James who insisted that his job was to prepare students for life. And he therefore allowed us to run an election within the school. And at the age of nine, I ran happily, successfully for the People's National Party. We lost the 1944 elections terribly nationally and within the constituency. And then I would move to the secondary school level and perhaps my greatest example of leadership is that I was elected as president of the Sixth Form Association. But in this context, and speaking particularly to a Caribbean audience, I would like to share a passage in my book, which reads as follows. In 1954, no matter the country of origin or the faculty to which we belong, we were all one big family on the Mona campus. Professors, lecturers, registry and hospital staff shared with their children on the campus and the entire student group one common place and fellowship. Within a short time, most of us would become devout regionalists, not by any process of indoctrination, but by intuitive acceptance that destiny had brought us together to fashion a dynamic, vibrant Caribbean identity. I should say here that when I speak of the University College of the West Indies, students came from everywhere, including Guyana and uh, Professor Trott says, will I'm sure speak about that. But I formed a friendship which developed into a marriage which produced my own two children. So they're in a sense part Guyanese, part Jamaican. Uh, it was my view that we were being prepared for leadership. 
and leadership, as you properly pointed out, was not confined to running for political office. It would include the judiciary, it would include the church, mm -hmm. and it would include public servants. There's a myth which we have adopted that ministers determine policy and public servants implement. I don't know of any policy that has ever been developed within a ministry after the elections where the staff of that ministry is not somehow involved in the evolution of the policy for that particular ministry. Indeed, if you try to do so and you insist that they implement, you're going to be subject to abject failure. And without resorting to reading another passage in my book, I would say that the friendships which we developed at the university served me well so that there was no part of the Caribbean that I went that I could not meet my peers and colleagues from the university. Now, one of the things in which we were engaged was in the federal experiment. And we had the audacity as students to draft what we regarded as the model constitution for the federation. And it is our considered view that the Federation collapsed because they did not follow our sage advice. But I learned from that the importance of having personal relationships. Indeed, one of the reasons responsible for the collapse of the federal experiment was that Norman Manley, Bantley Adams, and Eric Williams all of whom had been educated in their time in the United Kingdom, started off with a respect and a friendship, but that deteriorated throughout the years. They were hardly in communication with each other. And I learned from that the imperative of developing relationships with my colleagues as politicians, whether we share the same ideological outlook or not. And I was able to rely on some friendships and some associations which had developed in those early times. I also appreciated the role of the opposition so that when governments change in particular countries, we were not left out in the cold in our relationships uh, with them. And the last thing I'd want to say, which is emphasized in my book and my own approach to life, you must have a willingness to listen, to hear, to understand what people are saying and not always be telling them what they should do or what they shouldn't do because unless there is an acceptance in the country which subscribes to a democratic society, we are going to find a failure in the acceptance and execution of important policy guidelines. Thank you very much, PJ. Um, that's very. That's a very good way to open up this session. I, I want to ask Godfrey Smith now to to maybe read a passage from his book, and uh, perhaps like PJ, uh, give us some context. Yeah, thank you very much, <clears throat> and it's an absolute pleasure for me for me to be part of Bocas Litfest. This is my my third uh, participation. The, the the first two were physical. This is my first virtual appearance, but it's always a great pleasure. I think listening to Prime Minister Patterson, I think he provided the perfect uh, segue, the, the perfect launch for me when he mentioned the value and importance of cultivating personal 
relationships. He mentioned that the relationship between Prime Ministers uh, Manly Norman, Manly Grande Adams, and Eric Williams uh, was not good, deteriorated to a point, and led to the breakup of the Federation. The extract that I want to read, uh, to read from also points to what happens when the relationship communication and trust between very important leaders in this respect, Grenada's Maurice Bishop and Bernard Cord, deteriorate to such a point that it leads to abject disaster. The context that I'm laying there for is to highlight, as Prime Minister Patterson has said, the importance of personal relationships, building trust, listening tolerance, and where it could lead to, whether the divide is ideological or whether the divide is racial. And we have seen, regrettably, some signs of how sharp divisions can come recently in Guyana with the crisis over the elections and the violence that ensued. So although the passage I, I will read is a bit dramatic, it is a literary festival, after all, I think it holds lessons for what we should be aware of and be alerted to when ideological differences or racial differences or differences of any kind become so sharp that trust and uh, personal relationship breaks down. So I'm reading from the assassination of Maurice Bishop. And this is a passage taken from chapter 23. All hell broke loose after the crowd had freed Maurice from house arrest. Some in the crowd had threatened, we come in back for you all next. Central committee members, as well as soldiers, panicked. They had rushed to Fort Frederick in different vehicles. Abdullah received instructions to go down to Radio Free Grenada in case they tried to seize control of it, as they had done to Eric Gary in 1979. He was driven at 100 miles an hour to the station to put security measures in place. It was a live, fluid situation. His men were rushing up to him, bringing new information. He next heard that Fort Rupert and Cable and Wireless had been taken over. More of Bishop's men were looking to take over the logistics base in Granite. He rushed back to Fort Frederick. Lane had called him, Raymond Nelson, and Conrad Myers and briefed them. Eunice and white men, they were told, had issued threats. Civil war was imminent. Retake the fort, clear civilians, arrest the leaders. No weapons or documents to leave the fort. If fired upon, use all necessary force to retake the fort. Abdullah insisted that someone on the balcony of the ops room had fired on the advancing APCs first, mortally wounding mares and other soldiers which had caused them to shell the building in return. After the firing ceased, Redhead met Abdullah and Nelson in the parking lot. Abdullah still had a grenade clutched in his hand. Groves of people were rushing out. Redhead spotted Keith Pumphead Hailing and Evelyn Maitland making their way up the steps leading to the kitchen. He ordered them to join the line of captives which had already included Maurice, Unison and Jackie, because they were bourgeois too. Private Andy Mitchell seized Pumphead's pistol. Merlin Rouleau, a nurse attached to the PRG's medical center, had taken cover in the building that housed the Office of Mobilization and Cadres when the bombardment started. When it stopped, she hurried out and was heading down the stairs to the lower level of the fort when she ran into a line of captives with their hands held high above their heads coming up the stairs. She pressed her back against the wall, making way for them to pass. She recognized Prime Minister Maurice Bishop, Norris Bain, Fitzroy Bain, and Jackie Kreft. <clears throat> Behind them were a number of soldiers with big guns leveled at their backs. After they passed, she rushed down. She saw Vince Noel lying on the ground his face set in an awful rictus. She picked up a Coca-Cola bottle, rinsed it out, 
filled it with clean water and gently poured it into his mouth. The procession of captives marched as in a dance macabre to the parade square where Maurice had on many occasions inspected troops as their commander in chief. Now, soldiers accustomed to saluting him, armed with heavy duty machine guns and belts of ammunition were in the role of the Valkyrie. On the parade square, a soldier rushed up to Abdullah, telling him that he needed to take an urgent call in the communications room. Before leaving, he instructed his soldiers, Vincent Joseph, in call Kate Richardson, Vernon Gabriel, and Andy Mitchell to guard the prisoners. The soldiers stood around waiting for Abdullah to return while Maurice and the others were speaking among themselves. Vincent Joseph heard Fitzroy Bain say, them is in control now. In Colcate was a big muscular soldier with irrepressibly good humor. Like the others, he had joined the army after the revolution. Vincent Joseph was the eldest of the four and was in charge of one of the three companies at Calivini. He had been a police constable on the Gary and had been almost shot the morning of the revolution when the bus in which he was traveling down to True Blue Army Barracks had been pulled over by the revolutionaries. It was Vincent who had found Fitzroy Bain hiding inside a tunnel with some students. When they emerged, he snatched Bain because Lane had instructed that both Bains were among the leaders to be captured. He allowed the students to go. Vincent escorted him at gunpoint to join the line of captives already being guarded by other soldiers. Abdullah then had then given orders to march the prisoners up to the top square. Inside the communications room, PRA soldier Mandy Philip was talking to another soldier. The phone upstairs was constantly ringing. Eventually, Mandy left to answer it. He said that the voice on the other end was unmistakably Lane, who had asked to talk to Abdullah. Manley told the other soldier with him to go in search of Abdullah on the parade square and inform him that Lane needed to speak to him. Abdullah took the call. He then immediately returned to parade square and instructed the soldiers to line up the prisoners against the wall and take up positions facing them. Soldiers present near the parade square who testified at the trial of the Grenada 17 a few years later said Abdullah took out a piece of paper and told his captives that the order from the Central Committee was that they were to be executed. Abdullah himself has denied ever saying that. Jackie looked desperate and was telling Maury something, but he hushed her. If he died now, all he would be able to leave his children was the proceeds of a small life insurance policy. They were instructed to take off their shirts, Abdullah ordered Vincent Joseph, Cosmos Richardson, Vernon Gabriel, and Andy Mitchell to make ready. Fitzroy Bain pleaded, how all you could do that? We ain't done nothing to deserve this. What you all doing that for? Cosmos Richardson said some 36 years later that Abdullah was younger than he was. But if he refused to fire, Abdullah was capable of saying, okay, you go over there and join the line. The leadership, he said, could not have gotten anyone but Abdullah to execute the grisly task. Prepare to fire, Abdullah ordered. The firing squad aimed their Kalashnikovs. One, two, three, Abdullah counted. So that's my passage and, the, and set in the context of what I earlier prefaced. I think that's a very, very powerful passage. Um, and it really sort of reveals some of the underlying uh, events that happened leading up to that that very grues gruesome period in, in, in Grenada's history. Um, now, Alisa, um, would you mind reading for us a passage from, from the, the selected works of Andaya? Um, certainly, Andy, and, and thank you so much for having me on the panel. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I knew it was going to be difficult after hearing Godfrey. I, I read both of these um, very important books. And as I was saying to Godfrey before the call, I was physically shaking when I finished um, the book. And it's a little piece of me that, you know, I, I, the visceral response to what you describe is, is, um, is just leaves me feeling a bit shaken as I, I start here. 
Um, Prime Minister Patterson, you know, in his remarks talked about the importance of listening and that's something that we seem to have lost in the Caribbean. We got a lot of what we're calling the Anna Hardairsness to going on right now. But I think that's really important in the context of what the late Jamaican economist Norman Gervan described as the urgent need to democratize politics in the region. And I think that that sort of piece that Godfrey just read and shared with us really sort of um, takes that to its dramatic and violent conclusion uh, to make us think about the deformed state of the region in the contemporary Caribbean today, where we still, despite with all due respect, um, the prime minister's um, discussion of the need for consultation, um, the need for participatory governance and inclusion, we are still dealing with the legacy of a deformed model of a hierarchical relationship between the rulers and the ruled or the leaders and the led. And even saying it in that way should um, sort of ask us to take a closer look at, at, um, at what it means to be Caribbean in the contemporary world today. So the, what I want to share with you comes from this anthology that was just published. Um, and it's an anthology of the collected writings of the Guyanese social activist Andai, who has been described by political philosopher Anthony Bogues as a key figure in the Caribbean radical intellectual and organizing tradition. Um, she died in May 19, 2019, just one month after she signed off on the final essays to be included in this book. And I'm just grateful that we were able to, to, to bring it to publication. Um, I'm going to just read two sentences from her preface before I read the excerpt um, to remind you what the book is about, because the excerpt is pretty grim, but it's, a, it's sort of a commentary um, for folks to think about, not just in relation to Guyana, but the wider Caribbean, a commentary um, on, on perhaps to think about that in the context of what the Prime Minister and Godfrey read for you just now. So she begins, this anthology is meant for activists, younger and older, outside of and within the university in the Caribbean, the Caribbean diaspora and beyond, who know, even if that is all they think they know, that the point is to change the world. It is about the power relations embedded in every facet of our lives and the need to organize together to overturn them. So the excerpt I'm gonna read for you is called M, A Daughter's Tale. Some context, it was first written in 1982 and then edited for this collection. So it was written two years after the devastating Jamaican elections that left close to 1,000 Jamaicans dead. It was written two years after the assassination of Guyanese political activist and historian Walter Rodney. It was written one year before the implosion, the tragic implosion of the Grenadian Revolution that you just heard Godfrey speak about. She made a decision to include it here in 2019, four months after a no confidence motion was moved in the Guyanese parliament and amidst deepening political uncertainty that would culminate in the sort of um, crisis in Guyana over the last six months and the violence that has now led to a pretty fragile peace. And I'm sharing it with, with the audience today against the backdrop of a Guyanese election that exploded into Bacchanal following an attempt to compromise the account, engineer a fraudulent result favorable to the incumbent coalition uh, a bacchanal that took close to six months, a CARICOM supervised recount and endless trips to the courts all the way up to the Caribbean Court of Justice, with the coalition firmly pressing its own charges of rigging all the way through, charges that, is now, um, that are now being pursued through an elections petition. All of this bacchanal before an election result would finally be declared and the People's Progressive Party invited to form a new government. So bear all of that in mind. And for those Guyanese who are um, seduced into parochialism at this moment in our history, let us remember that this is a Caribbean story. The police band marched in their dark, heavy uniforms, brass trumpets glistening in the sun. The children stood for hours in the heat, the boys pulling at the ties, choking their necks. The girls, hair straightened and oily, protecting their starched white collars with their handkerchiefs. And when the governor came, they all lifted their heads and sang Rule Britannia. Then the boys went to London, to college, to London, Montreal, Washington, the girls to marriage, and M to mothering the children she taught in school, mothering her own mother. By the time she retired from teaching in 1975, M and her mother C had lived on top of each other for more than 10 years. To C's mind, the rules of blindness confined her to three rooms, sleeping space, the washroom off of it, and the living room to which she groped her way slowly each morning. Although M occupied more of the terrain of the flat than her mother, they shared too much of its intimate ground. 
sleeping in a single bedroom divided only by two wardrobes set back to back with each other. M would get up at six, careful not to wake C, make her way to the washroom, careful not to startle her, make her breakfast and call her, careful not to rush her, take the tray to her chair, careful not to jostle her, careful, careful. For the 11 or so years before M retired, her physical world had not been much larger than it became afterwards. The school she taught was less than two blocks from the house in one direction, the church she visited occasionally two blocks away in the other. For all those years, she seldom went anywhere except home, church, school. Inside school, classes were divided only by blackboards over which children's voices converged. The chant of London is the capital of England and Eng Edinburgh is the capital of Scotland, clashing with the chant of 616, 6212, building to 611, 66, 612, 72, while somewhere close by other voices declaimed or sang, I wandered lonely as a cloud, the Prime Minister will know this one, that floats on higher or veils and hills when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. C had been confined to the flat much longer than M, who had started to stay home all the time only when she retired. Ever since C had become blind, she'd left the flat only once a year at Christmas to spend the day with her son. 35 years, 11 with both women locked in. Oh, everyone knows the majority of people in the country live with less space but other people didn't live only indoors. It's the living only inside that made the geography in which they lived their lives too small for the two of them. It's living such unmediated inward looking lives while physically living only inside that did them in. Even when M was a girl, she had a sense of life being stifled though she couldn't put the feelings into words. Sure, she was happy sometimes, but she was the youngest and a girl and there were too many bosses over her. Besides, all of them were restricted although the rest didn't seem to mind. Their father was an important man in the village and their bad behavior was a reflection on him, or so he said. For years, she thought that when it was her turn for secondary school, she'd escape like her brother, who'd been sent to Georgetown when his time came, but no one even considered it. At least no one ever said anything at all about it to her. But there was one moment, much later, when her life seemed to open up. From the carved in stone rule of rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves and girls mustn't do this, mustn't do that. And my children can't play this or can't say that. She learned first the idea of change and then the possibility of change in what had seemed an immovable world. All over the colony as the country was in 1953, it was as though people were cleaning themselves of the trench mud that had dried hard on their bodies and spirits, shrinking them. Near their flat was a house in which women and men, old and young, different races, the most black, Town workers like domestics and waterfront laborers, teachers, nurses, doctors, lawyers, small scale farmers, clerks, unemployed women and men, even some businessmen gathered for hours every day to do all kinds of things they'd never done before with people they'd never done anything with before. M felt transported, taken out of herself. She didn't have a clue what would become of her private life. She didn't dwell on it. She wasn't thinking now about whether she would marry or not, whether she would have children or not. Nothing in the conditions of her immediate life had changed, but she had changed. And so everything had changed. Everything seemed possible. Everything was possible. And inside the home she shared then not only with her mother, but her three sisters. Everybody was working in the election campaign. The first time most of them would be able to vote. And the first time that they had women and men they could vote for who said life could and would change. At home, Em and her sister shared the work of looking after their mother and she made the work of looking after her something that didn't feel like a burden. Taking her a meal, helping her find the clothes she wanted to wear, they could talk and did about things outside themselves, outside the everyday, outside the old limits. The years passed. Outside in the streets, small girls and boys were taunting a woman who walked for miles each day, a cloth covering her eyes. Mad lady, mad lady, why you tie up your eye? Because Guyana not fit to be seen, she answered. Huh, like you a mad lady, laughed another woman passing by. The election had been won. Leaders had quarreled for power, then reached a compromise. Troops had invaded. A constitution had been suspended. Leaders had been imprisoned. Leaders had split first this way, then that, till town workers and country workers went their separate ways. And rich and poor lined up on the same side, provided they were the same race. She went one way, then the other, trusted by neither. And to cut a long story short, but how do you cut it short when it in fact has never ended? People who had been together rattled on each other, killed each other, raped girls and women, 
and said that all they did was in self-protection or at worst in revenge for what was done to them. And her sisters married, left, and she was left. Her life closed tighter and more airless than it had ever been before, whittled down to less than it was ever before, until all that was left was the life of the unmarried, youngest, grown girl child, all alone, mothering her mother as she grew bitter into old age. Wow, that's, that's powerful, um, Alisa. And I think all three books, while different, I think they ha all have something in common that is some very powerful narratives. And uh, I, I hope that people go out and buy these books because I, I certainly enjoyed reading them myself and would recommend them to anyone. I thought maybe one way that we can start the conversation, uh, drawing from what you've read in your books and, and the kind of is, is to see the direction um, that the books have taken. Um, you know, P.J. Patterson, I didn't mention this in the biography, but I think it's important to mention, has had time to, uh, to, to reflect on his legacy and, and his work. <clears throat> Everyone has the opportunity to reflect on their legacy and their work. Um, I think of Andaya's uh, death as, as an example of not being able to complete, for example, her, her biography. It had to be completed by Alisa and others. Um, I think about Owen Arthur, former Prime Minister of Barbados, who, um, you know, I, I, I talked to him just before COVID struck. <clears throat> it was in his office in, in Barbados. We talked about um, perhaps getting his autobiography together. And not knowing that within a couple of months later, he would be gone from the scene. And it made me realize the importance of trying to preserve legacies of people who have been actively involved in politics at every level, not just elected politics, but also grassroots politics. The importance of passing that information on to the new generation of, of, of people coming up. Um, the importance of, uh, you know, being reflective and being critical about one's participation in politics. I think that's very important. And uh, I wanted to start by say, uh, talking about P.J. Patterson's recent appointment um, by Sir Hilary Beckles as the, um, uh, the, at the center, the P.J. Patterson Center for African and Caribbean Advocacy to show that he is able to bring his, his, his long legacy of politics now into advocacy through this center, the institution being created by the University of the West Indies, I think it's very important. And I think, PJ, you can talk about this a little bit more. It's important for universities like the University of the West Indies uh, to, to preserve that kind of uh, legacy of politicians and grassroots people who have been working for a long time in trying to change the world, as, Alice, as Alisa's book uh, uh, says. So PJ, we want to talk a little bit about the uh, center. Uh, first of all, allow me to make a comment on what Professor Trott said. When she was reading the poem and came to the daffodils, she made a remark that I would remember it. She couldn't possibly have conceived how important that particular poem was to me. Let me share a story. In 1947, there was only one scholarship to the school I eventually attended. I had to sit a written exam, and then I had to travel all the way from St. James to Kingston to be interviewed by the headmaster himself. And among the things, having taken me through civics, math, um, simple arithmetic, etc., he asked me to recite a poem. And the poem by Wordsworth is the poem I chose. And I must observe here that when I look back, 
the extent to which we were influenced, we were subject to an outside influence mm -hmm. in our own development. It has stultified mm -hmm. what we can do for ourselves to a considerable extent. The second thing I'd like to mention, a moderator, Owen Arthur. I have to share a personal story with you. The last time I saw Owen Arthur was in April of last year. I had gone to Barbados to launch my book on the Cave Hill campus and I was returning home and Owen Arthur was on the flight with me. He said to me why he was coming to Jamaica. He was coming to make contact with sources for the book he was about to write, which I think is a book of very great importance. I have given my own perspectives of the development of the regional movement at that time. I think it's important that others share their views. He was coming to Jamaica then to make contact with his sources. And having done so, uh, he called me to say on the next occasion he came, he would be visiting with me for the usual chit chat and exchanges that we usually have. And I hope, I hope that between the university, between the government of Barbados and his family, there'd be work to collect those papers and to complete um, unfinished uh, business. And then the whole question of governance, uh, which is raised. Uh, I think we all are in search for the building of a, what I'd like to call a participatory democracy. One where the relationships between people and their government is not one that occurs only in at election time. And perhaps you will permit me then since I only had one reading of a small portion of my book, to refer to something which is discussed, how do we get a new paradigm for development involving people, involving civil society, involving our academic uh, community. And I said that the old order, the closed, distant and authoritarian systems of governance is being forced to give way to a structure which is inclusive, responsible and accountable to the new pro proud, informed, assertive Jamaican citizen of the 21st century. You made mention um, of the honor which has just been conferred upon me by returning to the Mona campus um, and to preside over the PJ Patterson Center. And I again, I must share with you, the launch, at the launch, I said, the wheel has come full circle because my first contact with Africa was in 1957 when I led a delegation from the university as chairman of the External Affairs Commission to Ghana and subsequently to Nigeria. And we have made very many efforts to try and build a bridge between the Caribbean and Africa. Africa regards us as the sixth region and we, of course, are the brothers and sisters on the other side of the pond. And the whole purpose of what we're seeking to do is to promote the presentation of policy options for Africa and the Caribbean, which relate to 
economic development, political structures, our history, to arts, to culture, and to sports. Um, I don't see myself writing another book, but I hope that what I will be saying in the course of trying to get this center a meaningful reality could perhaps one day be reflected in a collection of speeches in that regard. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I was reading a little bit about the launch of that center and you've made a, some comments at the launch. I, unfortunately, I wasn't able to come to the launch personally, but I read some of the comments that you, you made at the launch, uh, which I think are very powerful and very important. And one of the comments you said was that the world that emerges will be entirely different. I think you were talking in the context of COVID-19. Uh, the reconfiguration of global power and the restructuring of the global economy cannot be left to the market, to, to the to the market, or to the dictates of a few who determine the shape of the future by unilateral decisions and without international consultation. And the important point here I wanted to make here is what you said next, which was the interests of the less developed and the most vulnerable can no longer be ignored. I think I, I, you might want. I, to I, I stand. I stand by that. And I, again, I'm going to try and put it in simple terms. The world institutions and the relationships were, which were developed in the Bretton Woods institution reflect the realities of the situation then. Mm -hmm. To the victors went all the spoils. They put themselves in positions uh, where they would be at a permanent advantage to the detriment of all of Africa, all of the Caribbean, which were colonies. We now have between Africa and the Caribbean 67 nations. We can't be content to carry on the business in our countries based on relationships which were determined in the past in which we had no involvement, in which we could not participate. We don't, I, I didn't know in April the extent to which the realities of COVID-19 would compel a world, a global response to the calamity of portions which have never seen before. And when these decisions come to be made, we must be present at the table and have our voices heard and our interests taken into full account. That's the purpose of my center, to try and contribute to that dialogue which we think is imperative. And along those lines, especially when it comes to the input coming from what we'll call the subaltern, uh, the marginalized, the vulnerable, I wonder, you know, both Alisa and, and Godfrey can actually speak to this because I think Godfrey's book actually uh, reflects on an attempt, at least, by Morris Bishop uh, to break that that psych, that that particular barrier, uh, in order to be able to have um, uh, his country, a small small island uh, country in the Caribbean, um, have a greater say in what's going on in internationally. And Alicia's book, I think, uh, reflects the importance of using uh, the, hearing from the voices of those people who have been marginalized, who have been uh, suppressed, who have been uh, vulnerable uh, in society. And I think maybe you, both of you can sort of come in on this discussion and to talk a little bit about that aspect of your of, of the writings. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm happy to, to, to sort of reflect. And indeed, Prime Minister, I put that in on page 16. You talked about the Australian 
principal or vice principal at Calabar who made you recite that Woodsworth poem. So reading and I's book and that, that resonance was, I put that in partly for you. Um, I'm glad you ended where you ended um, with the comment about everyone being at the table. So let us begin by saying who is exactly at the table in the Caribbean? And I'll try to be really brief on this. If we look in the context of international or regional, the, the, the center that um, the prime minister was invited to join, I think is very important, along with the reparation center and or but, we could also ask about what happened to the very dynamic African, Caribbean and Pacific partnership um, that was sort of developed at a, a particularly sort of important and conv convulsive moment of South-South solidarity across the world, but, but really sort of um, was deeply threatened by the European Union's bullying, I'm not a prime minister, so I can say these things and get away with it, by the European Union's bullying in the context of negotiating an economic partnership agreement. We can ask about who's at the table in terms of regional integration. COVID is an important example of why we need climate change and all of these threats, why we need a united Caribbean. As the prime minister said, Norman Gervan also says, I went into the University of the West Indies as a Jamaican, I came out as a West Indian. But where are we with Caribbean community regionalism in 2020? Where are the Caribbean people? What happened to the Assembly of Caribbean Parliamentarians, which in and of itself was limited because it was only about parliamentarians, convened in 1996, met three times, disappeared. We had the 1997 CARICOM Charter on Civil Society, the 2002 Lillian De Declaration, the 2003 Rose Hall Declaration. You know, we have a panel coming up after this on Calypsonians extemporizing on political leadership. I think they'll get it right. But, you know, the mighty Gabby and Black Stalin had an extempo on regionalism where they said year after year is the same old thing. They keep in meeting after meeting. And then when we look at our politics within the region, like who exactly is at the table, right? So, so we're thinking about Westminster take all politics that we've seen in the context of a racially fractured society like Guyana um, has led to any time you have an election, at least half of the population feels completely shut out. And that is a coastal quarrel that really shuts out indigenous folks by and large. Look at Jamaica. Some people say you had a sweep. I say it's a minority government. You had the lowest level of voter turnout since 1983, less than 40% of Jamaicans turned out. And what does that say about their confidence in the political system today? Let's look at who is at the table in terms of a deeply patriarchal model. There is one female prime minister across the region right now. Um, even though there were far more Jamaican women elected to parliament, it's still about 29% in the parliament. And across the world, this is not just a Caribbean problem, only 10 of 152 elected heads of state are actually women. On the one hand, you certainly have folks who are doing amazing work. So there are women like Lynette Vassell and, and Judith Wedderburn, Maziki Tem, others in the 51% coalition in Jamaica, pushing to get greater representation of women in Jamaican politics, some amazing young people um, through the Pink Parliament in Barbados, an initiative that was led by Life in Leggings, which emerged as a response to endemic sexual harassment and violence against women in the region. If women were centered, politicians would understand that this gender-based violence in the region is a national emergency. Let me just say that. And so, you know, Pink Parliament is um, Life in Leggings and the Caribbean Alliance Against Gender Violence and the Barbados Youth Development Council. And their aim is to try to work with youth to get women's participation in politics. But we also need to move away. And this, I think, is what's really important for me about Andaya's book. We need to move away from a narrow, centralized definition of politics as a big P parliament, big P politics, and to have a more capacious understanding. And the, the late Jamaican Canadian political theorist, Richard Eiton, defines politics as, quote, a contest about what matters and ought to be subject to consideration and debate. A contest about what matters and ought to be subject to consideration and debate. So that challenges, uh, challenges us, I think, to radically extend our understanding of what politics is, where it could be found, who is speaking, whether it's the indentured labor of Beichu, who in the early 20th century was writing numerous letters to raise questions about the treatment of indentured laborers and particularly the sexual violence against indentured women on estates by white overseers, whether it's someone like, um, you know, like organizations like CAISO or in Trinidad and Tobago, J Flag in Jamaica, United and Strong in St. Lucia, Sassod in Guyana, who are putting questions of LGBTQ issues firmly on the table in ways that politicians can no longer ignore them whether it's the Amerindian People's Association in Guyana, um, 
talking about models of development that center their emphasis on, on different relations to land and, and title. So, so I, I do think we need to rethink this question. And, and, and let me just end here by saying, you know, whether we're speaking about someone like Walter Rodney or the amazing educator, someone like Kathleen Drayton, who in a speech that was given a day or two at the University of the West Indies before she passed away, who helped to set up the University of Guyana, helped to set up with other women like Peggy Antrobus and many others, um, uh, what would become the Center for Gender and Development in, in the Caribbean, who established the Barbados Association of Retired Persons. So there's another model of leadership. She talks in the same way that Walter Rodney talks or in the same way that in a recent column, Gab Hussain talks about a new generation of activists and speaks about the work of Tara Ramatar, who became a leader in the Caribbean um, Association for Feminist Research and Action, talking about learning about leaders, learning about leadership from the self-organizing capacity of working people. So the Kathleen Drayton, for example, talks about where she understood this was in the 1937 riots and seeing ordinary people on the streets in charge of their own destinies and filled with a particular kind of confidence about where they could go. And I think that's sort of where I want to end this by saying that this notion of politics as something for rulers, which is where Godfrey, I think, can come in, or of a vanguard or of an elite that does something on behalf of people who are always there to be led, is deeply disempowering. It's deeply patriarchal and, and deeply exclusionary. It amounts to what novelist, Barbadian novelist George Lamming refers to as the betrayal, the betrayal largely by a middle class that comes to, back, comes to power on the backs of working people across the region only to sell them out again and again and again. And that's a good segue to Godfrey uh, because your book talks about the, the need to bring people in to politics. And sometimes it has to be done in a revolutionary way. Uh, if, if the normal de democratic processes do not allow for that to happen. So maybe you can talk a little bit about um, Morris Bishop and his attempt to, uh, to, to bring uh, the grassroots into politics in his revolution. Before doing so though, Alyssa, after I had finished reading my passage, Comment, commented that it had affected her. I mean, what she just extemporized was so breathtaking and intense that I'm struggling to process it all, but all massive, huge points she's made. What I'd like to use my opportunity to do is, is to sort of to see if I could marry some of what PM Patterson said and some of the very important things. Alyssa said, and relate it back to the question, the current state of leadership, the question of leadership, what can present leaders or what have they learned from the past? In a sense, I think both Prime Minister Patterson and Alyssa are saying some fundamentally true things, perhaps from different angles. PJ comments on the need to have a new look at structures set in place post-World War II, the Bretton Woods institutions and so on, especially in light of the, the current crisis that we face to see how we can make these things work better. Alyssa points to the question, asks the major question, who is at the table? Who is, who is in charge of coming up with these policies that will take us forward to face these challenges. I think what I liked about some of the past leadership um, and many leaders across the Caribbean is the fact that in the past, we saw the emergence of some truly transformative leaders. Mm -hmm. Michael Manley, for instance, as PJ knows better than I, totally understood the world economy, the global economy, and where Jamaica and the Caribbean fit in. He wasn't content with tinkering. He wanted to make structural changes. That is how the concept of the new international economic order came into place, which Manley was one of the main advocates of and was able to draw outstanding big name first world leaders to Jamaica to discuss People like Manley, Maurice Bishop, and indeed Bernard Cord wanted to transform their societies to make it work better 
for ordinary people. I know times have changed. The, the, the Caribbean has gone through the anti-colonial struggle, one phase leading up to independence. The post-independence struggle for economic viability and to find economic models that work. And now what I could perhaps call tongue-in-cheek, the Francis Fukuyama phase. You will remember that Francis Fukuyama, a relatively obscure Sovietologist, was catapulted to international fame because he happened to have predicted or got ahead of the rest of people in saying <clears throat> that the collapse of the Soviet Union heralded the end of history, as he called it. And what he meant by that was that the, the end of the Soviet Union and the, the creation of a unipolar world signal the end point of ideological evolution and heralded the universalization of Western liberal democracy, which he hailed as the highest form of human democracy. Regrettably, <clears throat> it seems to me, certainly within CARICOM and perhaps beyond, that leaders have just thrown up their hands and simply accepted, well, look, we're in the United States backyard. We can't question any of these structures that may not be working. And they just follow it. And I think the time has come as, and I hope that PJ's institution will, will somehow be involved in looking at how do we use this opportunity, perhaps of the COVID crisis where everybody's facing difficulties to, look a, to take a hard look at structures. Um, PM Patterson would have been all too familiar with the West Indian Commission which was set up sometime in 1989 to get ready for the new century. Alyssa had, uh, alluded to some of the things that came out of it, the civil society charter, the uh, assembly of parliamentarians, but he'd also, this, this West Indian commission that was led by some serious heavyweights like Sir Shreda Ramphal, Alistair McIntyre, Roderick Rainford, and others had, come up with some serious recommendations saying basically, if I can distill it, that unless the region unites and works more closely together in the way Alyssa has alluded, we're going to have serious problems. I am not sure that we have made great strides since the commission's report, which was entitled deliberately, time for action since that came out in 1992. We're almost 30 years later. Central to that report was a Caribbean commission recommended to try to be an executive arm of CARICOM to try to shake off some of the bureaucracy, some of the huge time lags and delays it, it took to get things done. And uh, Andy, you said that, that we were free to ask each other questions and so on. If, if you may permit me, um, PJ Patterson has spanned all phases. He has been around from the anti-colonial struggle, true independence, post-independence. And I think we're not, we don't know how often we'll get a chance to be with him and to ask him questions. But I would really like to hear P.J. Patterson's view on, is there, a, is there room to revisit the time for action? Or is some new, some new report needed? How do we take off from where we left off? Too often in the Caribbean, we find ourselves going back and reviewing things that we mentioned over and over. Alyssa alluded to some of this. How do we begin the process of really pulling Caribbean leaders together to examine structures and to try to take the region forward. Let me try and respond to the questions raised. In the start of the 1970s, we had in the region leaders such as Forbes Burnham, Eric Williams, 
uh, Errol Barrow, and of course, Michael Mann. And we had persons who were part of the supporting cast. Ramphal, Sir Alistair McIntyre, Billy DeMass, mm. massive contribution. And I won't deal with the political um, ministers like myself, but I've been in it as Jeffrey from the start. The first meeting of the Caribbean community, which I attended in my capacity as head of government, coincided with the laying of the report of the West Indian Commission, Time for Action. A special meeting was called and we engaged in extensive debate. Critical to that report was the constitution of a commission that would have the ability to enforce and implement decisions taken. The debate was intensive, but try though we, a few of us did, we could never get a consensus on the establishment of that commission. On the grounds, that maintained it was going to be a diminution of their sovereignty. I never accepted it because we have joined the uh, various things, the UN, which require us to do certain things and refrain from doing certain things. That first meeting at Chagaramas under Eric Williams as chairman was historic. It signaled a determination and a resolve of the four countries that were independent at that time to move forward, including the recognition of Cuba and positive relations with Cuba which is a part of the Caribbean. Jeffrey asked, where is it now, the central um, body? And I agree with him that there's no need for any other further study. Hmm. We have exhausted all the options. It's time for a reflection of the political will put that enforcing machinery in place. Now, we acted as a unit in the negotiations for what emerged to be the Loam Treaty. Mm -hmm. And we were able to advance the interests of the Caribbean by forming an alliance with the countries of Africa. Mm -hmm. But for them, there would have been no leverage for us as Caribbean people. We got involved not only at the political level, but also at the technical level with some of the people whose names I have already mentioned. And I would add for this purpose, ambassadors in Brussels like um, Scotty Lewis, Frank Francis, and others. The results showed what can be achieved through unity. But the, the European Union recognized how we were, how effective we were as a single bloc. And they proceeded to try and break up that solidarity by dealing with okay. separate yes. blocks, which 
fabulous of the collective strength which we enjoy. I think, quite frankly, that was a fatal absolutely on our part. And persons like myself who were then out of the system um, made or said what we could, but the results were passed. Uh, in my book, I speak about our Caribbean village in the global space. And I've already spoken of the um, insistence that in the new negotiations for a new world order, we must be present at the table and we must not allow ourselves be marginalized any further. Now, what we have to recognize is that in the intervening years, there has been a tendency, a deliberate attempt to split us. And I'm afraid to say it's happening in CARICOM. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the difference in our approach in relating to Venezuela is the best example of that. More so when there is interest in a commodity which is being found to exist in abundance in Ghana. It would be a serious difficulty for us to achieve our objectives if we allow ourselves to be fragmented. The greatest thing which confronts us is climate change because we're all vulnerable to natural disasters. We have to deal with the problem of COVID, uh, which has emerged and we have also to address the question of debt, external debt. Various efforts are being made in individual countries. But what I see happening is that too many of our leaders are concentrating purely on the domestic problems and not recognizing the extent which collective action can help us to encounter the difficult challenges that we face. Thank you. I wonder if Alisa can respond to some of the points that you just made there. And also bear in mind that we have some questions from the audience, which I'd like to sort of throw in as well. So Alisa, go ahead. You might have to un unmute, I think. Sorry. Sorry, two things I wanted to say in response to the Prime Minister. I absolutely agree with him about, um, you know, the tragic course of action that the Caribbean community took in the late 1990s with regard to allowing the EPA to break up the, and threaten the, the, the ACP through using a carrot and stick approach and telling us that we had to negotiate first and we had to no, negotiate. No, 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 please, Colette correct you, not the 1990s. Okay, well, okay. It never would have happened under my watch. Right. I can assure you because okay. I was chairman for the external um, economic external negotiations, and there was no way I would have agreed to that approach. It, this is something uh, that they started to work on at, in the new millennium. Right. The question of finalizing it came after I had the party. Okay, I, I think we could, you and I should come back to talk about the European Union and the ACP sure. because we obviously, I think, will also agree to disagree about what happened in the 1990s and why the Caribbean jumped to sign a separate partnership agreement in advance of the others, but we don't have time for that here. I think what you say about having to have a united foreign policy, this was one of the benchmarks of CARICOM was foreign policy coordination. And I think that's very important. And just in honor of Owen Arthur, who before we even get into that, we should know that he, as, as, a, as, a, as a champion of democracy and people's sovereignty and their will, 
also came to Guyana as part of the, uh, as the head of the Commonwealth Observer Mission, right? So he came there and Andy, I think you've noted that you spoke to him about his disquiet over what was happening with the Guyanese elections shortly before his death. But at his funeral, Mia Motley reminded the world that it was Owen Arthur who also stood up to the United States against the imposition of a ship rider agreement. Mm -hmm. And it was Owen Arthur who also took the brave stand in 2003 to oppose the joint US, um, UK, um, Iraq war. And I say that here in relation to Venezuela in the context of which in a very divided country, a very divided country, we, where Mike Pompeo arrives two months before the U.S. elections and holds a press conference um, and, and, and announces at that press conference in front of the president of Guyana who has just been elected out of a very fractious period. And so the, the tragedy of this, and we should remember that CARICOM itself was central to, to, the, um, to the recount. So we don't need to thank the United States, the last country in the world we should be talking about when it comes to democratic elections. Um, but in the presence of the sitting president, um, talked about the fact that Maduro must go, and I'm quoting directly from Secretary of State Pompeo's speech, that Maduro must go, the Cuban security forces must go, and named the Lima Group, of which Guyana is a part, and said that the Lima Group, he made this general comment to the press conference, had recognized um, Juan Guaido as the legitimately elected head of state of Venezuela. Even though Guyana is a member of the Lima Group, in February, um, the Guyana government refrained from, um, from voting in favor of a motion recognizing, recognizing Juan Guaido. So, so this raises all kinds of questions. And the, the very next day, a ship rider agreement with Guyana was signed. And I say this because the main thing that was, um, that was identified as the basis of signing the ship rider agreement was about a drug interdiction and uh, narco trafficking with Maduro being named as the supreme narco trafficker. I simply raised that because again, I read the prime minister's book and was deeply moved by the section where he talked about the solidarity that he extended to um, President Jean-Bertrand Aristide after he was a democratically elected president of Haiti, after he was removed to, to Africa. And there were all of these attempts to try to deny him being returned to, to the Caribbean. And Prime Minister um, Patterson took a really courageous step of standing up to the United States and saying he is coming to Jamaica. And also references that in one of the calls, he was all of a sudden told, well, you do know that the Haitian president or the Haitian government is into narco trafficking. So, you know, without getting into comments about, about the internal sort of affairs of the Venezuelan government, I'm no apologist or defender of Maduro. But this attempt to sort of steer the Guyana government in a particular direction, in a context where CARICOM has actually remained silent, I think for all of us across the Caribbean must be deeply worrying, particularly when Mike Pompeo went to Jamaica and Mia Motley very courageously spoke out against that. So I think that it's really important for us to say that. And, and the last thing, as you mentioned, Michael Manley, let me just point out, it's not enough to have women in power. It is important to ensure that those women are advancing an agenda that recognizes gender and other forms of justice. And that under the Michael Manley regime, which had very few, if any, women in parliament, a lot of very progressive laws were passed, including for maternity leave. But that would not have happened. And this is where we do need those histories. I was having a conversation with Peggy Antrobus, where she talks about the work of women in the People's National Party and the cross-party work they did to ensure that they kept the feet of the male parliamentarians to the fire to get many of those laws passed. And, and so that kind of um, history from the bottom up that reveals the kind of leadership that put effective political pressure on our leaders um, in parliament, the big P leaders, I think is, is also important. So I wanted to take this opportunity to thank Prime Minister Patterson for sharing with us that anecdote about what happened with uh, Jean Bertrand Aristide as a reminder of what Caribbean sovereignty in a united context should look like today. Alice, if I may, do you think that the kind of women activism that held parliamentarians feet to the fire to achieve progressive laws is building from strength to strength, has stagnating or regressing? 
I, I don't do want to take up too much space here, but I would say that there is an incredible generation of younger women um, from Alicia Wallace with Equality Bahamas in, in, um, in, uh, in, in Bahamas to Ronel King in Barbados, to, um, you know, uh, Marsha Hines Lane in Barbados, Stephanie Leach with Womantra in Trinidad, um, you know, uh, ICAD, there's Kenita Placid in St. Lucia. I think there's incredible efflorescence of young and exciting women at the same time that many of the old heads, Peggy Antrobus, Lynette Bassell, Anna Ford Smith, um, Rhoda Redock, they're still here. So I do think that with women, and it's not to say it's not tension free and not conflict free because we always abuse up each other as well. Mm -hmm. But I do think that there's some really synergistic intergenerational dialogue and conversations that are taking place could be better. A lot of it, you know, at the, you know, is not as inclusive perhaps of Indo-Caribbean women, certainly not inclusive of Amerindian women. So there are things that we need to do better. And particularly in relation to grassroots women and the class divides, much that we could do better. Although you have women with the, you know, Domestic Workers Union in Trinidad and Tobago, the Domestic Workers in Shirley Price in Jamaica. So, but I do think that you're seeing there a model for intergenerational dialogue and respect that really could be multiplied in the other kinds of spheres that we're talking about. You know, let me, because we only have less than 10 minutes uh, remaining in this wonderful uh, panel, but let me just throw in a question from the audience. I have one here from Wesley Gibbons uh, via YouTube, who speaks directly to Godfrey. And he says, how does your account of what happened in Grenada in October 1983 reconcile against Bernard Cord's narrative in the first of his two new books of the period of 1979 to 1983? I don't know if you had the chance to look at Bernard Cord's. Yes, uh, actually, I had to. Um, I was obliged to care. For, actually, I read, um, I read his account, the Grenada Revolution. What really happened? I had to read it three times. I mean, it, uh, this this is his account of what happened, which uh, conflicts to a large extent with with my account. Um, so I don't think the two are are reconcilable. In my own view, I think Cord's account, um, and I'll speak bluntly, is self-serving. Uh, and I think after you finish reading it, he should have named it, it, it was all Maurice's fault. Um, my book takes uh, a different view. Um, in, the, in the afterward, I accept that there were things, in fact, that Maurice must shoulder some blame for, but by and large, I place responsibility, and I say so, for the demise of the Grenada Revolution, squarely at the feet of Bernard Cord. Readers will shape their own view. Let me just make this point that in telling the story, uh, I reserved my own views for the afterward and tried to let the story tell itself based on what I was able to research. So, so that would be my response to it. Hmm. And maybe can, I, yes, thank you very much. I, I, maybe we can throw in another question. Uh, this one for Elisa and maybe all three, uh, you can sort of wrap things up. But this has a lot to do with the, the path uh, that the WPA in recent years has taken. And we have a question by Wesley Gibbons on via YouTube who says, Elisa, I'd Sorry, and Daya's uh, view on the path for, Guy for Guyana appears to be have been abandoned by the WPA in recent years. What is your assessment of the party's current role in the country? Ah, as I said, I wasn't necessarily um, coming on to discuss Guyanese politics, and we have six minutes to go. Um, mm -hmm. All I will say is that I don't know what. Um, we would mean by her view for the Working People's Alliance. She left the Working People's Alliance in the early 1980s. Um, and I think that's what I want to say, that she left the Working People's Alliance after the collapse of the Grenadian Revolution and after its implosion, what she saw in terms of the demobilization of, you know, thousands and thousands of ordinary Grenadians and women in particular. And that was one of the reasons that she actually left formal party politics, that she left party politics because she did not see that it could actually deliver on the aspirations of organized people organized and working in a self-organized capacity. 
um, and, and that led to her involvement in and co-founding of Red Thread. So I think if we want to take any lesson from that, because we will never know what she would say if she were still here. Many people talk about what people would say and they're long dead. We don't know what they would say, um, but we can take a lesson from that um, in terms of a comment on the WPA and the, all of the political parties in Guyana and as a warning to the new political parties that have come up that political parties have often been a vehicle um, for, for the, the ambitious um, and, and a vehicle for the ambitious that often leads to the disconnect with the, the mass of ordinary people um, and, and, and ambition for disconnect, even though they still seem, so we could think about that in the context of the WPA today, still seem to champion a language of multiracial unity of the working classes. So the political parties today are not um, in any shape, way or form capable of delivering that. And I, I think the, the verdict on that came in with the, you know, the 38.3% turnout in Jamaican politics, which is a, a real indictment. And I, you know, I would urge folks to have a look at Prime Minister Patterson's book, where he talks, I believe, very movingly about genuine need for consultation. And that democratization must take place, not just between party and, and, and the general public, but as he says, and as Godfrey's book so clearly points out, internal democracy, right? No vanguardism, no democrat democratic centralism, internal democracy within the parties themselves. Right, so we have to wrap up now, unfortunately, but I, I, I should mention okay, go ahead. That the execution of Maurice Bishop and the collapse of the government there caused ripples throughout the Caribbean. And in the case of Jamaica, it resulted in an election being called on a list that was no longer current. And the, the party led by Michael Manley decided to boycott those elections we did. And we were able to use that time to organize to have a convincing victory in 1989. Thank you very much. I, I want to thank, first of all, our panelists for this wonderful discussion about the three very important books, but also thank the audience for getting involved in this discussion as well. I'm sorry that we have to go, but thank you very much for your time and your patience. Thank you. Thank you.